All right, and welcome back to part two of part two for our data screening lectures. So we ended on this last video here looking at linearity. Well, let's move on to normality. Okay. So for normality, this assumption tends to be interpreted that the data needs to be normally distributed. And that's actually not accurate. It's that the sampling distribution needs to be normally distributed. So whatever you're doing right this moment, you're gonna pause this video. And what you're gonna do is go over to Firefox, Chrome, Safari, whatever your favorite is, and search for distribution bunnies and YouTube. Okay, right, so let's try that. What you're gonna find here is this very first video with this set of bunnies and dragons on it. You're gonna watch that video because it is great and it will explain to you this idea of sampling distribution a little bit more. If you watched it the first time when we talked about the central limit theorem, good job. But in case you need to see the cute bunnies again, cause they're very cute, you can look at it um, by watching again. And so remember that the idea here is that the sampling distribution is normally distributed, not the data. The sample distribution, remember, is this distribution of means given estimated from many samples of your data. So at what point, given the central limit theorem and the fact that we know that with a large enough sample size, the sampling distribution will uh, approximate normality, what is the magic number? And it's in, in is greater than 30, okay? Smaller than you might expect. Unfortunately, this magic number, like much of the many of the other magic numbers that exist in statistics, has caused all kinds of issues. But with a, a sample size of at least 30 participants, one can assume robustness against violations of normality. Okay, and what that means is that it, more than likely the sampling distribution will be normal. And even if it isn't the statistic is probably still fairly accurate. Okay, so normality is a fairly robust assumption um, for most of the statistical tests that we'll do as long as we have large enough sample sizes. Now, mathematically, this number may be 30 and it's often considered this sort of magic number, but practically sample sizes are better estimated at much larger so that we get more confidence in our parameters. Right, so our model fit improves because we have more representation of the underlying population. Okay. So for many, many moons, I've always said, as long as n equals 30 or more, you're fine. But I will caveat that with larger samples are always more representative and sample sizes in this 30 to 50 range um, probably don't necessarily represent larger groups of people. So in practical terms, as long as your sample size is fairly large, outliers are a bigger problem than normality because many of the models that we're gonna use are based on the mean as a model. And we've already talked about how the mean is negatively affected by outliers, especially model fit. Okay. And so what we can do though, just to check, um, is to look at the sample distribution of our residuals or our error as an approximation for multivariate normality. Okay, multivariate normality here, meaning the, the normality of like kind of everything taken together. So the same idea applies. If multivariate normality is not met, I could check the distribution of each individual variable. It could also look at their skew and kurtosis values. Remembering that the, dis the, the question isn't if the sample is normally distributed, but the sampling distribution. Okay. So if this isn't met, generally what I do is go, well, my sample size is pretty large, so I could probably still trust this statistic, but there are non-parametric versions of everything we're going to do that don't assume a normal distribution. So there are alternative statistics that um, bypass this assumption because they don't assume that this is necessary. But again, with rather large sample sizes, most of that is a moot point. So how do we check for this? Well, remember in our earlier lectures, we covered how to check the histogram for each variable individually. You can also use ggplot, but these don't need to be pretty. 
So we're going to leave ggplot for our pretty plots. And so we could calculate histogra the histogram on each variable one at a time. And I would tell you that most Likert scales are not normal. Okay? Most of them tend to be fairly skewed and they tend to have a positive skew bias, meaning that they, um, I'm sorry, they're negatively skewed. So they have a, a positive answering bias. I mean, they generally people tend to acquiesce. Okay? Uh, meaning I pick strongly agree rather than strongly disagree. So almost all of them are going to be negative skewed, right? Because this is the this is the cat's head, this is the tail. This one's almost uniform, meaning it's almost flat across the top. Now I can also check using our skewness and kurtosis options from our first couple of weeks here and look at each one. Let me zoom out just a little so these line up. And remember that we want um, values that are small and close to zero for skewness. And for kurtosis, what we did was I subtracted three from each one to get excess kurtosis. And then now we want, again, things that are small and close to zero. And we do have some kurtosis here. Like I said, um, they tend to be fairly kind of skewed to one side. So that will also cause kurtosis. It's hard to have skew and not have kurtosis. Um, and so you kind of see that we have a little bit more kurtosis than maybe we would want because there's only seven answer choices, right? It's, hard, it's harder to get a normal distribution when they're skewed and there's seven answer choices. But this isn't actually the assumption. For heavily skewed distributions, things like response latency, so how fast someone can click a button, those are very, very skewed distributions. The solution is to take the log of the variable. Now, a lot of times people argue against transforms on variables because it makes the, um, the model more difficult to interpret. So I have to remember that this is the, the mean of the log of the variable and not the mean of the variable anymore. Okay. And so this will heavily depend on the research field that you are in. So the one of uh, like for me in cognitive psychology, it's not that unusual to take a log of a distribution to help solve problems of heavy skew. Okay. So it, it's pretty normal <laughs> to do that. But in other fields, the, the people just say, don't, just don't do it because you can't interpret the output. Okay. Depends on your background. But in general, with large enough sample sizes, it's not gonna matter too much, so. Outliers, yes. Um, skew and kurtosis, no. So instead of checking them one at a time, what I'm gonna do is check for multivariate normality by looking at a histogram of the standardized residuals. Okay. And we want our distribution centered over zero with, hold on, here's our rule, negative two to two. Okay, we'll see that a couple times from, from the last lecture. Okay. And so let's look at it. So I did the histogram of our standardized residuals give it breaks of 15. And looks like I get a little bit of skew here. So here's zero. And we want the tall bars over zero and then mostly evenly spread between two and two. So most of the data is pretty, pretty much two to two, but it's not evenly spread. I do get a little bit of positive skew. Why if our data is negatively skewed, am I getting a positively skewed residual. Okay. And they will tend to kind of like mirror each other like that. Because if I'm predicting, first of all, I'm predicting a random variable. But then, um, you know, if I'm predicting a variable, that's always positive, and it's positive towards the top, the only place to go is down for my guess, right. Um, and so we would, might tend to see the skew go of the all of the combinations go the other way. So these are this, this is the distribution of residuals. Okay, so our, our distribution of residuals should also be normally distributed because there are a lot of things, a lot of very close errors and only a few far away. So we do have a little bit of skew here. It's not terrible, just a little bit. Now, uh, here I have 117 people. And so this meets our magic criteria of N is greater than 30. So I'm probably okay. Okay. Most of the tests we're going to use are robust to violations of skew, okay? meaning that the answer that you get after the statistical test is done is still fairly accurate. 
Last but not least is going to be homogeneity and homoscedasticity. And these are our scrabble words for the day. So homogeneity stands for homo equal geneity variances. So it's the assumptions uh, that the variances of the variables, but not really the variables so much as of the groups. So mostly people apply homogeneity in the case of categorical um, IVs predicting continuous DVs. So the groups have to have approximately equal variances. But, um, and so that particular test is called Levine's test where it tests the variances of each group against each other. And in Levine's test, you would not want P less than 0.01. Remember that our alpha for statistical, the, the uh, data screening checks is lower because we want it to be really wrong before we do something about it. The alpha for our statistical test might be 0.05, which is a common criterion, but we really want to lower the, the cutoff score for our, out, our outliers. That is also true for our assumption checks because we want it to be very bad before doing anything. So Levine's test specifically comes up with ANOVA. Uh, Box's test is a multivariate ANOVA or MANOVA. Okay. And we'll use those with their specific analysis. Okay. So those will come back later this semester. Now, another form of homogeneity, it's kind of a complex version of this, is called sporicity. Sporicity is for repeated measures data where I have the same participant tested multiple times. And it's the assumption that the differences between repeated measurements have the approximate same variance and the approximate same correlation. So let's say we measured somebody four times. We, what you would do is take the difference between one and two, one and three, one and four, two and three, two and four, and three and four, and see if they have the same variance. And then take the correlation between one and two, one and three, blah, 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 and see if they have the same correlation. It's a compound test, and it's almost impossible to meet the assumption of sporicity because generally in a repeated measures analysis, the goal is often to violate it. <laughs> For example, let's say you're trying to get people to quit smoking. Okay. And at the beginning of the study, there's a wide range of number of cigarettes smoked. And at the end of the study, you hope that everyone's a zero because you've done your job. And so almost naturally by the design of the study, I am reducing the variance across measurements because we want people to slowly move to zero and have no variance. And that would violate the assumption. So sporicity is kind of a tricky one because in a perfect world we would have it, but it often is very difficult to meet just naturally because of what we're trying to do. So let's look at a, a visual here about sporicity is often done with Mockley's test. All right, so here's the idea. We have all these different uh, measurement points, right? These cats, this is our categorical IV here. And this is the, the dots here represent each person. Okay. This side would be homogeneous or uh, where we have homogeneity, where there's approximately equal variance between each of these groups. Okay. This side would be heterogeneity where the variance is not equal between each group. We can also do this with more of a confidence interval kind of bar. Um, and you can see that these are all roughly the same and these are not. Now, the other version of this is called homoscedasticity and it's still equal variances, but it's a different take on equal variances. So it's the, uh, the variance is equal let's say we have one X and one Y, the variance for each point of X is equal for each point of Y. And that's actually the same idea, right? So for homogeneity, what we're saying is for each group, the variance on Y is the same. For homoscedasticity, we're saying, well, for each point of X, the variance on Y is the same. Okay, that's the same idea. Because if X only has two points, you know, male and female, <laughs> it's the same assumption. So that's why I lump them together here is because uh, they're, sometimes they're treated separately, sometimes they're treated differently, and they have sort of different scenarios and there's sort of different ways to check them, but 
the conceptual idea is very similar that the the spread of the variances should be equal along x and y so the variance of y is at the same is the same at each spot of x and here's an example of how that might look okay now this plot we'll look at here in a minute but this is have equal spread Anytime you get Dorito chips, I've always thought of these as Dorito chips, I don't know why, but anytime you get these triangles, bad news. That's no good. Now, we can also check for linearity on these plots. So if that first QQ plot came up bad, you will also see it usually in the graph where you get these curved shapes. You don't want that. And so this would be curved, uh, but a fairly equal spread along that curve. And here, this would be both are bad. It's curved and the spread is unequal. So let's look at that in our data. Okay. What we're gonna do is create a scatter plot of our fake regression. We're gonna plot the standardized fitted values that predicted score for each person, remembering that we're predicting a random variable. And then on Y, we're gonna plot the standardized residuals and that's the difference between their predicted score and their actual score. Okay. Again, remembering we're predicting, we're predicting a random variable. Okay. So along X and Y, we should get a random smattering of dots okay. because we're using our data to predict a random variable. And so we should get a random prediction. And when prediction isn't random, that implies that there's something unequal in our, in our variables. And then the whole reason to standardize both of them is just interpretation. So we can keep going with this negative two to two rule. All right. And so it should look like a bunch of random dots. And let's look at it. So I'm gonna do plot, fit values, comma standardized. It's okay if you flip these because it doesn't matter which way. We're gonna draw a line at zero, zero, and then a line at Z, V equals zero. So this is a horizontal and a vertical line at zero. And that just helps in interpretation. So let's see. What you wanna do is look at this, for homogeneity, we wanna look at the spread across, um, well, it's really for both, but this is the way I've taught it for a long time. We're, for homogeneity here, we really wanna look at the spread across zero. So here it runs from two to four, but our four here is kind of two lonely outsiders. So most of the data is between two and two. Again, be nice. Okay. And here, most of the data is between two and two, and it runs up to four, which normally isn't good, but there's two people on any of these two outsides. Okay. So I may have to reconsider my outliers. Okay. But in general, is most of the data evenly spread around zero is the question. Yeah, looks okay, okay. You could say, yes, it looks okay, minus these two screwballs we have on each side. Now, what you don't want to see is it clumping up in the middle. Um, well, clumping in the middle is okay, actually. Clumping up like on one side, and that would not be evenly spread. So I have to look at the spread of the graph on the bottom, but I also have to think about where, how many dots are in each spot. Oh, excuse me. Now for homo skedasticity, what we want is that the spread of the data is even all the way across. So you can ignore zero for a second. And we just want the spread of the data. So you can just kind of draw an imaginary line around your data points. And do you get a like nice rectangular smattering of dots? And as, if I ignore these points out here, I, I pretty much do. If you get a triangle shape or my all time favorite drawing that a student has done for me has been Chuck Norris kicking something it worked for that graph, um, then no, you don't have homo okay. I can get what looks like a fairly even spread around zero, but have it not be, um, you know, on one end it's smaller than the other. So we get this kind of megaphone shape. Okay. Generally, if one of them is bad, the other one tends to be bad as well okay. because they're so heavily tied together. Okay. And so we'll just check them together. Do you meet this assumption, this, this equal variances assumption? In this case, I probably would say we do, minus these kind of outlier points out here. 
Now, this is a randomized variable, so you will get different plots if you run it again. I'm on the other screen running. Here it is. So let's look now. So here's linearity a second time. Still would we'll come up with approximately the same answer. Let's look at normality a second time. I get a little bit, it's a little bit more normal, but still we got a little bit of skew out here. Not too much, just a little bit like last time. And this one here. Okay, we hadn't got to this one. This time, it's all right. So mostly between two and two. Okay, fairly even spread. I would say it's a little bit missing like right here. Okay. But in general, so I'm, I may say there are issues with um, homoscedasticity because this is smaller over here than it is in the middle. Okay, so see how the spread here is a little bit smaller than the spread here is a little bit wider. Okay. So your question hopefully is, is it problematic <laughs> that I got different answers? So what, uh, you know, for your assignment, I'm just trying to get you to understand how these graphs work. But what I tend to do in my real analyses, um, if I'm using this procedure, is just run it several times. Okay. And in general, you'll get the same answer over and over again. Okay. So run it again, that actually looks pretty good. Okay. So test it a couple times. And the, the answer of the consensus of the answer is the answer. Okay. So homogeneity and homoscedasticity, probably okay. Normality, I have a little bit of skew. That's pretty consistent. And linearity, it's pretty close. Okay. All right. So to kind of summarize this homoscedasticity plot, so you can remember the rules, homogeneity, in, what we'll do is we'll look at the spread above, below, above and below zero. Is the spread around zero fairly equivalent? And we don't want a large spread on one side and a small spread on the other. You can think of that as kind of raining. Our graph is raining. Okay. Almost gets elasticity. It's a spread all the way, equal all the way across x, no matter where zero is. Okay. So no megaphones. By that, I mean that like kind of skinny on one end, cheerleader megaphone on the other end. No triangles and no big clumps of data. Okay. And so it should appear to be a even random spread of dots with the rule that you should always be nice to the graphs because okay, they're just graphs. All right, let's summarize all this. So altogether, what we've talked about is independence, additivity, this is our correlation question, linearity, normality, homogeneity, and homoscedasticity. So for each of these, we've talked about how to plot, interpret, and understand each assumption. And remember that the assumptions will change based on the statistical test. So we're gonna revisit this with each of our next chapters and talk about when they apply and how they apply. And then you'll get to practice looking at these on um, those real analyses. So that sums up data screening. And now that means it's time for the midterm.